At Popular Science, we report and write dozens of science and tech stories every week. And while most of the stuff we stumble across makes it into our articles, we also find plenty of weird facts that we just keep around the office. So we figured, why not share those with you? Welcome to The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week from the editors of Popular Science. I'm Rachel Feltman. I'm Sandra Gutierrez. I'm Sarah Gailey. Sarah, welcome to the show. We're so excited Thank- to have you. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, listeners, Sarah's, they've written some of my favorite books, uh, including The Echo Wife, which like is a book I do not shut up about because uh, it made me laugh. It made me cry. It made me um, want to maybe do weird science experiments in uh, my ex's basement. I don't know. <laughs> but Sarah, <laughs> why don't you tell listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do? So hi, yeah, I'm I am an author of uh, genre fiction across lengths and forms. So I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror of all lengths and styles um, in comics and in novels and in short stories. Uh, basically, anywhere that people will allow me to write, I do. <laughs> um, and I I'm just I'm so thrilled to be here. I did want to share. Because you brought up The Echo Wife, my favorite review of The Echo Wife is the only one that has called it a comedy, and that was, <laughs> I believe, in Popular Science Magazine. Um, it was oh, a review. That's that's a compliment. It was a review written by a scientist that said, this is hilarious. Um, and I was, I was deeply complimented because I did want it to be very funny to scientists. Yeah. Amazing. I thought it, it had moments of great humor. <laughs> so, I, when I when I was researching it, I talked to my sister who is a lab scientist, and uh, for my research in conversation with her, I just asked her what irritates you most about the people you work with, and that's where <laughs> I think I got the best content. <laughs> yeah, amazing. A lot of pipette controversy. Oh yeah, pipette controversies are very real. I only did science as an undergrad, and even I experienced pipette drama. Um, Well, we're so excited to have you on. So let's get into the show. So on the weirdest thing I learned this week, we start by each offering up a little tease about some kind of fact or story we found in the course of reading, writing, reporting, stealing pipettes, etc. And decide which one we just absolutely have to hear more about first. Then once we've all had time to spin our little science yarns, we reconvene and decide what the weirdest thing we learned this week actually was. Dot, dot, dot. Not really anymore. I decided that we're all winners here, but uh, it's fine. I love that for us. <laughs> uh, Sandra, what's your tease? Okay. Uh, peacock overpopulation has been a long-lasting problem in Miami, and now one suburban neighborhood is trying to take care of this issue by giving the birds vasectomies. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I love that, right? We're going to be talking about bird vasectomies. I mean, your, um, your strong pitch, great energy. Love it. Thank you. Now I have to revise mine because my pitch also involved wild animal vasectomies. (laughs) Oh, please. The more wild animal vasectomies, the better. Uh, Sarah, what's your tease? (laughs) What does a cocaine empire have in common with the meat question? And how can both be solved by giving megafauna vasectomies? (laughs) Wow. I mean, you bit me. You bit me right there. (laughs) I, um... (laughs) I will admit to listeners that I specifically uh, asked Sarah to be on because I had been thinking about doing something related to this topic for a while. And then when I started researching it, I was like, wait, Sarah Gailey wrote a book about this. (laughs) (laughs) This is my chance. Um, So I'm very excited. My tease is that I want to talk about uh, why Einstein's brain got stolen and what scientists' obsession with it can teach us about intelligence and also hubris. Um, Where's the vasectomies? Yeah, sorry. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) listen, uh, there probably could have been some if I had if I had tried hard enough. Um, But I'll I'll explain (laughs) later. None for (laughs) Einstein, though, as far as I know. Um, Sandra, why don't you get started. I feel like we should like bookend our animal vasectomy stories and uh, I can just pop in there with some yeah, some weird absolutely brain, brain in a jar stuff. I, I will open the vasectomy special of the Thank weirdest you. thing. Okay, <laughs> so 
Uh, the last time I was in Miami for something other than a layover was in 1998. Yes, I'm old. Which is probably why I did not know that parts of the city were positively overrun by peacocks. And when I say overrun, I don't mean to just be dramatic. Peafowl have been a problem in Miami-Dade County for years. Picking at Teslas, squawking loudly before dawn, and terrifying residents with the scratching sounds they make when they jump on their roofs. <laughs> wow. And I would do some ASMR right now, but I mean, I cannot, you know, convey the terrifying, you know, sound of the people. Yeah, you know, that's like a, that's a dinosaur attacking your own. Oh, yeah, yeah and they're, absolutely. They're big, <laughs> yeah. right? We're going we're gonna to get to uh -oh. that. We're going to get to that. That's a great segue. So before we do that, by the way, uh, I don't know who needs to hear this, but I didn't know this up until recently. So I'm just going to assume that there are like a lot of people listening to this podcast who don't know it either. Technically speaking, peacock is the name of the male bird with a flamboyant display of exotic and shiny plumage. This species is called peafowl, and the female of that species is called a peahen. Under this logic, peafowl babies are called peaches, oh. which is very cute. And it's also something I think that only someone with a full-on dad humor must have come up with. <laughs> so before this invasive species ended up running amok in Miami, they were brought from India and commercialized as exotic yard ornaments in the 1920s and 30s, which is, you know, very fitting you know, because... Peacocks are very like crazy swinging twenties, I guess. <laughs> very art. Yeah, it's true. The the most like Art Deco bird you could have. Absolutely, absolutely. In time, they became more than just a shiny moving garden gnome and turned into a common sight in Coconut Grove, a popular touristic area in the south of Miami. There's even a peacock park there. Which fun fact? I thought it was named after the bird because duh. But it turns out it was named after the descendants of one of the first settlers of South Florida, which is a guy named Jack Peacock. No. You know, ter really? Terrible coincidence. <laughs> yeah, um. I know. It's it's insane. And there are like peacock statues at that park even. Like, Conspiracy theory anyway. starting now. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Regardless of the mistaken identity, peacocks have become a sort of symbol of Miami. And they're part of the scenery. They're beautiful. And people absolutely love them. So what's the problem with them being everywhere? And this is to Sarah's comment. Have you ever seen a peacock? They can grow up to be four feet tall, which is pretty big for <laughs> yeah, a That's only one foot and shorter than me. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's like they're, they're huge. <laughs> we actually sort of like don't realize how big they are, even without the shiny plumage all displayed and all. Um, and even though they strap you with this beautiful shiny plumage, uh, they have sharp beaks and talons, which makes catching them somewhat of a dangerous sport. And also, they're not the brightest. Peacocks are definitely up there in the himbos of the animal <laughs> kingdom ranking. And they're known to peck at and scratch dark colored vehicles because they see their reflection on them and think Aww. it's another male. So they attack it. So they, they've destroyed a lot of Teslas out there. Okay, but is that... Does that make them a menace to society? Or... Yeah, it sounds like allyship to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, listen, I, I have absolutely no problem with peacocks destroying Teslas, but, as, you know. As long as they're not going after people, through Honda it, Accords, we're fine. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for these people in this suburban neighborhood in Florida, they're not very, sure. you know, I can understand why they, um, they wouldn't absolutely. appreciate that. And also, also, uh, peacocks can be kind of jerks. Uh, there have been reports of peacocks harassing kids holding food, and they can get very territorial around mating season, which is half of the year from December to May. <laughs> That's a long so time. So it's not like just, <laughs> yeah, it's not like a month, right? A well, hot girl semester. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In their defense, though, peacocks attacks are rare, but not so rare that we don't have a name for the pathological fear of peacocks, which is pubophobia, by the way. And finally, to add insult to injury, peacocks poop everywhere. Sure. Their feathers clog AC units, and they are very vocal. Miami residents have been complaining about the birds waking them up in the middle of the night and interrupting their Zoom calls with all the squacking. <laughs> up until a few years ago, peacocks lived mostly in Coconut Grove, but then they moved south to Pinecrest because, surprising to no one, construction was destroying their habitat. Pinecrest is an affluent residential suburb with, you know, with all the Teslas. 
and they have a lot of trees and foliage. So peafowl love it there. But the problem is not relocation, it's overpopulation. So according to the Miami Herald, one neighborhood reported a population of 250 free roaming birds. Other towns like Longboat Key reported 120 peafowl living among their small community of 8,000 people. That's, yeah, that's so a lot of peafowl per capita. That's, yes, exactly. The ratio is pretty crazy. And, you know, there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is the weather, because basically there's no winter in South Florida. So exotic birds that would otherwise die thrive in Miami heat. The other factor is uh, regulation. Back in 2001, when peafowl weren't doing so good, Miami-Dade County passed an ordinance to protect the birds from being killed or captured. So Floridians can only, like, shoo them away from their property by turning on their sprinklers or something. Um, and uh, you can't just trap and release them in the wild either because peacocks are not native. So the only other alternative would be to trap them and get a sanctuary or zoo to take them in and those are hard to come by because peacocks are just everywhere. So they're like, you know, we have enough peacocks. Save it for yourself. <laughs> we're good. We're good and on the peacocks. We're, we're good. We're good on we the peacocks. We hit quota, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe the other logical option would have been to temporarily lift or somehow update that 2001 ordinance that protects peafowl. But Floridians feel very strongly about their birds. For example, back in April, there was outrage in a neighborhood south of Pinecrest called Palmetto Bay after 18 Muscovy ducks were humanely euthanized because they were being aggressive. People were so upset, they held a candlelit vigil for the ducks. And I'm not judging, because if I lived down there, I would have been there for the ducks. And I know you guys would be too. So yeah, it's always, not judging. It's very, um, it's very hard when... Uh, an animal from like a an ecological standpoint is, um, you know, a menace and being disruptive. But also, it's basically, so cute for the bird. I remember I know. one time back when I was at the Washington Post, I covered this study where a guy had. I think I talked about this when um, Bethany Brookshire was on talking about methods of getting rid of cane toads and like their the flying butt cane toad thing. Go back and listen, folks. It was a great episode, but. Um, <laughs> I covered this study because I was so fascinated that this researcher had like dedicated time to figuring out the most humane way for everyday people to euthanize cane toads um, because it, it's a really uh, there's a genuine need for that in Australia. These yeah, very that's a problem. Dangerous yeah. uh, animals, and if you like find a bunch of them on your property, you really should get rid of them. So, like, what does one do? And he tried a bunch of different things and came to the conclusion that in terms of like safety for the human effort and like minimizing suffering for the animal, uh, freezing them was the way to go. And so many U.S. readers emailed me being like, why are you <laughs> sharing why are you educating people this like on not killing animals <laughs> research study? <laughs> and I was like, Listen, I feel like if you lived in Australia and had to deal with a bunch of venomous cane toads, you might feel differently about this man's research. But it's really, um, there's a fine line between people being able to accept like, okay, yes, ecologically speaking, this is a pest. And like, right. come on. Yeah. It's well, adorable. So and the, it's, the pest it's divide bad. is so strong. Like East Coast people, the way they feel about deer and the totally. way that I feel about deer are complete opposites. I got to visit there and I saw deer eating apples off someone's tree in their front yard. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so idyllic. This is so beautiful. And I mentioned so majestic yeah, oh, nature. And then I <laughs> mentioned it to someone who lived in the area and I saw the venom enter their eyes when I said the word <laughs> deer. I just saw the hatred fill them like the green goblin. <laughs> Yeah, but and also like it's it's very hard to draw that line, especially when you're talking about like majestic animals like deer. And in this case, also like, you know, the peacocks, because they're so beautiful and they're like a symbol of the city and everything. But like they're a problem and it's it's fine. It's it's, it's fine to address it as a problem, which is what the Miami-Dade residents did, along with complaining to the county commission, which earlier this year changed its strategy from being patient listeners to like, uh, well, why don't you try an approach? <laughs> and they asked municipalities to submit projects and ideas to control peafowl population. And because they do not want to stick their peacocks in huge 
freezers and right, like get sure. rid of them. I, I think it's a it's just a very different animal than a cane toad. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like you the, the, the math is folk. just really different there. <laughs> cane toads and peacocks, different animals. Yeah. <laughs> different. You heard it here, first. you know, slightly different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's why Pine Crest Vasectomy Initiative was the second one to be approved. And in case you didn't know, peafowl live in harems, which means exactly what you think it means. One male mates with a bunch of peahens. So for every vasectomy you perform, you prevent up to seven females from laying fertilized eggs. Huh? So that is efficient, but it's also expensive and labor extensive because... You need to start this whole thing by chasing and trapping the males, which is a lot to begin with, because remember, these are big birds. <laughs> then you perform the surgery, provide post-op care, and then you rinse and repeat, right? And in populations that can go up to like 120 peafowl, you know, it, that could take time and it's expensive. So I do wonder, though, if they would have proposed costly vasectomies as a solution if these birds weren't as colorful and majestic. But maybe that's just me expecting the worst from people. But you know. I think that's probably that's a very fair question. Also, I do just want to say that from the moment you said these are big birds, I was picturing Big Bird from Sesame Street. <laughs> For the rest of your talk. So I will say, I will say that the Latin American equivalent of Big Bird, Avelardo, very colorful. Resembles, yeah, it's very colorful. It resembles a peacock. So, I mean, it might be. My favorite episode from my childhood of Sesame Street was V is for Vasectomy. (laughs) I just thought it was a really good one. (laughs) Amazing. Okay, so guys, do you ever think about avian vasectomies? Because I do. I can't say <laughs> okay. that I have. I did in my book, like I wrote like the first, the intro was just like 2,000 words about duck penises. Um, but well, that's yeah, just the form. Somehow, that's what introductions to books are like. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Like you need you need to start your book talking about duck penises. Yeah. Like how, how do you but ever do I'm that? I'm realizing now somehow, somehow duck vasectomies never came up. Well, that's embarrassing for you. Well, yeah, I do. Well, let let me let me tell you about it, Rachel, because I'm very excited about avian vasectomies. Funny enough, avian vasectomies are pretty similar to human ones. The anatomy is pretty much the same, uh, but it looks different, you know, for obvious reasons because humans are not very. Oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! <laughs> I'm learning so much I mean, today. So that means humans are cane toads. Yeah. yeah okay. It's two yeah. categories. Absolutely. Ab- two categories so as a refresher because you know i'm just like laying all the wisdom down here for you guys as a refresher vasectomies both on birds and humans are simple surgical procedures that often cut and cauterize the vas deferens a couple of tubes connecting the testes to the mating organ so that sperm can be released during sex unlike ducks geese swans and you know it humans peacocks don't have a penis Instead, they have a small bump of erectile tissue on the back wall of their cloaca called a papilla. A papilla. I don't know how to pronounce that, but a papilla, whatever. It's only a tiny protuberance, but it grows during mating season and it does the job quite well. Just ask people in Miami. <laughs> uh, so when you perform a vasectomy on a peacock, again, just like in humans, the bird can continue to act as the dominant male and mate with their entire harem if they want to. The only difference is that the seminal fluid it ejaculates during mating will not be able to fertilize any eggs. So everybody wins, including the Tesla owners of Florida. I <laughs> for these I, sur- I have to ask us to edit that entire bit out of this podcast because I got into an argument with my partner the other day. She said, do birds have penises? And I said, you fool, of course birds have penises. And reminded her about duck penises, which we already knew about, <laughs> and said, so obviously birds have penises. What's wrong with you that you would think that birds don't have penises? And when you said um, peacocks don't have penises, I saw my life flash before my eyes. She is going to listen <laughs> oh to my this. God. That, and I'm that going to get roasted. <laughs> <laughs> that is, in fact, the focus of the intro of my book is how, because I knew about duck penises, I just always kind of thought other birds also had penises. They were just like small and no, actually, it's it's only, I want to say it's 3% of all bird species have penises. Yeah, And the rest, it's exactly. like this little, it's like a fingernail like sized, and they just kind of, they it's just rubbing. Um, yes, exactly. Nothing wrong when, with that. They, but yeah, no, no penises in sight. 
So me and you, Rachel, we're we're as one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, peacocks made uh, by like rubbing their cloacas together. So there's no like, th- there's I feel like there's some sort of penetration, like a little bit, because this this thing sort of like enlarges a bit. But I'm not entirely sure. Apparently, that is enough that they can just you know do their thing. Yeah, they they, they do it quite well. There are a lot of peacocks, so <laughs> it's fine. Um. So for these surgeries, particularly the peacocks of pinecrest, will most likely be sedated with isoflurane, which they'll inhale from tiny little air masks hey. designed especially for their beaks. Then the veterinary team will access the bird's reproductive organs through small incisions between the cloaca and the pubic bone or by using endoscopic techniques, which make the procedure slightly less invasive and complicated than a full-on castration. And as far as we know... All of this very exciting things may be happening right this second. So we don't know if this is going to solve the peacock problem at Pinecrest or even at Miami-Dade. But research shows that just like what happens in humans and other mammals, avian vasectomies are safe and overall don't have reported, reported negative effects. They don't change breeding behavior, hormonal levels stay the same, the courtship and copulation post-surgery remains unaltered, so peacocks should be just fine. And also the Tesla owners. <laughs> so everybody wins. Amazing. Well, I'm so glad that they're they're trying something. Um, very curious to see whether a few years from now they're like, well, that was a lot of money we spent uh, doing yeah. all the peacock that's activity. Yeah, and this is and this is also a pilot program. Apparently, uh, the governance of this particular village is also uh, helping other villages and other municipalities to do the same. I mean, I bet that it will depend on whether or not this makes a difference. Sure, yeah. But like, it should. It theoretically, it should be enough to sort of control the the population of peacocks, so they can keep the peacocks and also like you know not have them in a roof like scratching away i i really <clears throat> after we finish recording i'm going to go and look up um small town papers from this area because you've mentioned that people who live in this area love the peacocks but also are complaining about the peacocks which means that the letters to the editor in the small town papers of this area are going to be so zesty <laughs> and that's my favorite thing oh my thing. god i so have true. not thought about that i i should have definitely looked that up but I will. I will do the same exercise after this is over. <laughs> I, I live in a very tiny town. It's about 4,000 people. And um, our letters to the editor are, there's always at least two argumentative letters about steelhead trout um, in the local paper every week. And they get heated. And it's just <laughs> delicious to me. I love mess. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. I love that for you. Incredible. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with some more facts. Okay, we're back, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, Einstein's brain, Einstein. Um, So I've wanted to talk about Einstein's noggin for a while, but I decided to finally take the leap because my sort of hometown haunt, the Water Museum, has been in the news. Side note, I know some people are going to be like, why does she keep saying the name of this museum different ways? It's because uh, I know what an umlaut is. <laughs> I know that the correct pronunciation of this word is something like water. However, uh, I grew up in South Jersey where we can't even say all of our consonants. So we called it the Mutter Museum. <laughs> so listen, it's all fine. Uh, the museum itself says if you can't pronounce the umlaut, the second best thing is to say it like scooter, mooter. And I'm like, that's terrible. I don't like that at all. So anyway, it's fine. Um, just caveat. I know. Leave me alone. OK. <laughs> um, but the museum is where medical students, history nerds and hot goth girls alike go to learn about the history of medicine through the lens of these like genuinely creepy and genuinely beautiful displays that include sopified corpses, phrenology skull collections, watermelon sized ovarian cysts and fetuses with various uh, deadly congenital disorders. And so 
it's been in the news. I won't go too deep into the current controversy. Also, FYI, we're recording this in August, so um, there may have been movement of the subject uh, by the time this publishes. But the long and short of it is that um, this museum that's been collecting and displaying medical paraphernalia and human remains since 1863 is under new management. And a lot of people are freaking out. Uh, the museum is run by the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, has been for a long time. And the group's new president uh, recently kicked off an audit of the museum's collections, which on the one hand is definitely good and necessary to do. Uh, like most museums, if not all museums in the U.S. and other countries with a history of colonialism, um, that it has loads of human remains of unknown, sketchy or overtly unethical uh, providence. And while parts of the collection have done um, a pretty good job of like working to humanize and contextualize the people whose remains are on display, other exhibits are like for sure overdue for a revamp. And that's not even getting into the stuff that like should probably be returned to sender uh, and dealt with in in a more ethical fashion. But according to a lot of devoted fans and some of the folks involved in running the museum, the process of this audit has like not really played out in good faith. There's a lot of scuttlebutt in the local papers um, about this like totally erasing an identity that the new powers just see as being like tacky and cringe as opposed to really being motivated by a desire to like make the museum more ethical and scientific. Uh, for instance, there's been a bunch of back and forth about the fetal remains, uh, which like authorities on the subject say were donated with full parental consent to understood they were going to be displayed. Um, but the current administration keeps talking about them as being like somehow distasteful and inappropriate inherently. And so a lot of people are um, a little anxious about that. They're like, who is that pandering to? Like, what is that about? Um, and unfortunately, too, the pushback to the audit has gotten the attention of some folks who want this to be a story about like the PC police ruining an American institution. Meanwhile, the fans who most of whom are like queer anarchist goths are like horrified by that and are like, no, we just want them to do a better audit. That's good. <laughs> and so the conversation's gotten very muddled and um, hopefully the folks in charge will like keep their promise of, first of all, getting people of color, indigenous people, people with disabilities, the chronically ill and members of other communities who are potentially impacted by uh, the, the less sensitive and well-handled aspects of this museum or hurt or exploited, um, that they'll actually invite them in and get them to weigh in on what should be done, which they've said they're going to do. Um, and hopefully they'll use, you know, a scalpel instead of a meat cleaver to <laughs> refine these exhibits. Uh, I'll link to a few pieces about this on popside.com slash weird. Uh, but I was, I found a, a really great piece about it by uh, Rifa Lehrer, who uh, is a disabled artist and writer who teaches medical humanities at Northwestern University. Uh, she wrote this in Art in America. And it really, really gets at the heart of why places like the Mutter like, need to reckon with their past and change for the better, but also expresses some really thoughtful criticism of the ways the people in charge have been talking about the museum's current vibe and like it paints a great picture of what the mutter could become that like I'm positive that most of the fans who are freaking out would be thrilled with. There's kind of this tension right now where the people who are in charge of the audit are kind of talking about the idea of this stuff being on display as inherently gross in a way that's like also kind of ableist. So it's like it's a very complicated question. And a lot of people who adore this museum or at least like see that it can be this really awesome um, like beacon of knowledge and intrigue for uh, people whose bodies were always othered and marginalized and ignored by science um, that like it, it could become even better and cooler. So anyway, that's why I was thinking about Einstein's brain because <laughs> It's one of the more ethically dubious, but most commonly praised specimens uh, at the museum. Um, and in fact, I, I saw some like online 
spectators of this controversy basically saying like, how could you possibly say that, that this museum should be shut down? For God's sake, they have Einstein's brain on display. And I was like, little do you know, sir. So here I am <laughs> to, 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 to make you feel bad about it. Um, first things first, Albert Einstein's brain was straight up stolen. Um, he wanted to be cremated. Uh, very clear on this. And when he died of an aortic aneurysm in Princeton, New Jersey, in 1955, the pathologist who presided over his autopsy, uh, Thomas Harvey, was like, surely not. And he just like spelunked his brain out of his skull and kept it. Um, now, people How read into this. Saying. That's so yeah. bad to do. That's right. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, there's no way. That's absolutely insane. There's no way and while you're like, doing that that you can tell yourself this isn't a big deal. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, I'm just I'm just going to take this. No one's going to miss it. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like it's, it in a jar. it's not like his cause of death required going into the brain case. It's just not something you could do as an afterthought. Like you really decided to do this. And so much of the stuff that's written about this incident there's like, as an aside, in his defense, hospitals did this all the time. And I'm like, yeah, and it was bad. <laughs> I mean, hospitals did a Not lot of stuff all the time. Not everything hospitals do is fine. <laughs> um, so Einstein's son, Hans Albert, found out. Um, and apparently Harvey then convinced him retroactively that like the scientific value of his father's brain was such that cremating it would be a tragedy. And Hans was like, okay, as long as scientific research on it is published in reputable journals. Um, he but must have had a plan for this conversation too, because it's not like you can, like when you say that his yeah. son found out, it's not like it's a thing you have to really investigate to discover. It's like, how come this corpse has no top of the skull? Exactly. anymore and the inside's empty <laughs> and it sounds the like lid was open what happened is that the person who was kind of like legally overseeing einstein's estate was there for the autopsy and was like sure i guess you're right he probably didn't mean the brain and then after they had cremated him and they had this like private ceremony somewhere along the delaware river um as einstein wanted to scatter the ashes then apparently Hans Albert found out that the brain had not been part of it. So I'm kind of like, maybe he would have had a different answer if there had still been time to like put the brain back with the rest of him. Right, <laughs> like, right. There was not much he could yeah, do at exactly. that point. Exactly. So um, it's not great, guys. That's that's the bottom line. Um, and despite Harvey's big talk about using Einstein's brain to like unlock the secrets of genius. It mostly just got carried around the country for the next, like, 30, 40 odd years. Um, Harvey was not a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon. Um, he actually did not remain a doctor for that much longer afterwards. It sounds like he failed a board's exam at some point. The ethics um, portion. Which is, yeah, <laughs> which is not to dunk on him for, like, his, his uh you know, medical skills. I, I have no idea. Maybe he was an excellent pathologist, but he sure was a little, he had sticky fingers. So, um, but yeah, the point is he was not at all qualified to do the kind of work that he was arguing really needed to be done with this brain. Um, but it seems like he really saw this as being his ticket to become a, um, a really important a clinician and research scientist so uh That's so gross yeah yeah so he lost his job at princeton hospital uh not sure why was not related to the brain again at the time everyone was like yeah sure you know you take out the organs that might be cool and you save them <laughs> so <laughs> um then he spent some time in philadelphia and there he he had somebody dissect the brain into a bunch of blocks mounted a bunch of pieces on thousands of slides and then he proceeded to just like kind of travel around doing different jobs around the Midwest. Um, occasionally he would give some universities some slivers of brain to study. Um, but it was only, uh, sorry, I got to pull up the timeline of this and another. This is just so Catholic. This is so reliquary. 
It's so it like really is. you get an ort Your of sliver of the Einstein brain. Christ's I was, nostril. I was like, thinking more of like, hey, my my mom sent me a meat pie. Do you want a slice? Like I'm not going to eat it, you know, all. <laughs> so like, you know, I might as well just share yeah, this it. This is just um, me trying to give people zucchinis that I grew in my garden all summer. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. I don't want it to go to waste. Um, yeah. So in 1978, um, Stephen Levy, the uh, science and technology reporter, uh, basically his boss was like, you should go do some investigating and track down Einstein's brain. Nobody knows where that went. And he um, found Thomas Harvey in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, apparently was like, hey, so I'm writing a story about Einstein's brain. And Levy says he said to him, I really can't help you with that. <laughs> and then after they got to talking, he was like, OK, OK. And he like goes off in the corner and like moves a beer cooler and takes out a box of cider, except in the box of cider are jars with Einstein's brain in it. No, um, are you shitting me? And that is bomb. That's yeah, not cider at all. No, <laughs> no. And when Stephen Levy was like, so why do you why? still have this? Nobody's published on it. What didn't you promise? Like extra pinky swear that if you were going <laughs> to take this, it was going to be because people were going to publish research on it. And he kind of waffled and it was clear, at least, you know, Stephen Levy presents this very clear um, narrative of Thomas Harvey still really holding on to hope that he was going to find a collaborator who was going to like help him do the groundbreaking research on this brain. Um so it wasn't until 1985, uh, 30 years after Einstein's death, that the first uh, study came out on his brain. Um, and it was someone at UCLA who had been given one of these slivers <laughs> that uh, Stocking Harvey... stuffer. Yeah, yeah. Now a piece of the meat pie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. And um, I, so I have hey. um, a few... Uh, no one's given me a piece of anybody's brain and I'm kind of feeling left out at this point. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe someone should think about uh, pieces of brain as like party favors for weddings. Like those tiny jars that they sell. They're like, oh, thanks for coming to our wedding. Oh Here's God. like a piece of brain from somebody. That's so okay, romantic. You it for the first anniversary. I know. Um, <laughs> you have a piece of my mind with you now. <laughs> so um, a few years ago, uh, a researcher basically did like a, a poster for a conference where he like systematically broke down what was wrong with all of the studies that have come out claiming to have found some difference in Einstein's brain because there have been a few since uh, 1985. Um, so just like to go over a few of them quick, like in that original 1985 report, um, which didn't like involve Harvey as a collaborator. Um, so he did finally find that person who was willing to like have his name on the paper. Um, they said that Rodman Area 39, which is a place where the temporal, parietal and occipital lobes meet, um, had a significantly smaller neuron to glee ratio uh, than in the same area as 11 control brains. But... The control group uh, was not very well controlled. Uh, the brains came from people age 47 to 80 and Einstein died at 76. So that's like a pretty, you, you would want to be looking at other like 76 to 85 year old brains, you know. Um, and also those brains were fresh. This is the thing that keeps coming up is that people starting in 1985 were like, okay, now we're really going to get down to it and study this brain. And it was 30 years old. <laughs> so there's just all this stuff where it's like eh, it's been in a beer cooler <laughs> like um so and also uh the researcher who broke these down uh which i'll, I'll link to on popsat.com slash weird was also like cell counting is always subjective and the researchers involved knew which tissue was einstein so like that's inherently you know come on a bias yeah. um in 1996, uh, Harvey partnered with another scientist, um, and they were counting neurons in uh, Broadman Area 9, which is part of the frontal cortex, uh, along with five controls. And they found no difference in the number or size of neurons, but Einstein's tissue was thinner than controls. Again, like it's an old piece of brain meat. But listen, uh, they were like, okay, it's thinner. So the, the neurons were more densely packed. 
So the cell to cell messages were traveling over shorter distances. So that meant faster processing speed. So he was thinking faster. And this is just so um, that's like so speculative. That's based on nothing. So first of all, it's like questionable that they even found a significant physical difference. But then a lot of these studies make such leaps to be like, ergo, and we just we can't do that. Um, yeah, this is a very jerky to stake comparison. Yeah, yes. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's an old prune. Like you can't you can't get a lot of information from like a brain that's already 30 years old and it's like yeah. crinkly and stuff. And everyone doing these studies knows that they just really want it to not be true because they really want to find some special, special brain boy secret in Einstein's brain. Um, in 1999, uh, and this one was actually published in The Lancet. Ooh la la, Hans would have been so happy. Um, and this one, they looked at old photographs of the brain from the pathology report, like before it was cut up. So that's like, okay, you got a picture from 30 years ago. Um, and they use that to claim that Einstein had an abnormal folding pattern in his parietal lobe, Come which on. has been linked to mathematical ability. And like, again, it's like, it's really questionable that they would actually be able to make definitive conclusions about these structures using the pictures. And the researcher pointed out, Einstein wasn't actually a great mathematician. <laughs> he was a great physicist which is not the same thing if he had wanted to do math he would have done math but you know it's all the same i guess if you're just somebody who wants to poke at brain pictures um and come to conclusions um this is and, great to me because they're just like studying skull bumps but from the inside it's they're like, so true oh and, he had an and, enlarged node associated with theft and vice it's like okay it's so similar and yeah, like, you know, at this point, I think it's um, it's not controversial to say, like, no one successfully found anything significantly different about Einstein's brain. But for a few years, there really were um, people were very, like, credulously talking about this. And, um, you know, brains differ so much from person to person that the idea that you could take five brains and even say oh because this one's different that means it's a really special different brain you would need to look at so many brains to make that conclusion first of all and so it's like such a subjective thing it's really uh you know the sample has degraded <laughs> and um and also just like there's this bias and you see in so many of these studies there's no attempt to get around the bias like they're not not at all blinding the fact that like this tissue is Einstein's. Um, and listen, that's like absolutely going to skew results when you're looking at something this um, subjective. And also, one of the only things that um, we can say pretty definitively about Einstein's brain is that it was a little on the small side. And I love that because, again, none of it matters. <laughs> um, <laughs> brains are... It just sounds yeah. like such a waste, dude. Like, like you went through all the trouble of, like, stealing a brain, <laughs> which is a felony. Like, like let's start there. Yeah. And then you just, like, stuck it, like, stick it in, like, a beer cooler for 30 years. You ruin the sample. And then, like, all of this happens. But, like, again, like, you already went through the trouble. Like, you might have as well just do the thing, I guess. I don't know. Ugh, yeah, it's, it's very it's frustrating. So stupid. And yeah, it's also, you know, they're... Sorry. My thought just totally flew out of my head. A pathologist stole it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome timing. <laughs> Actually, I have a friend who's a pathologist and... Uh, we dated for a while and it was while he was working as an organ harvester. And so there were a lot of jokes about him stealing my heart. Um, oh, what am I <laughs> uh, and now you've given him a it, piece of your mind. That's true. <laughs> there were a lot of in, in, in practice. It was a lot of him being like, if I don't text you back, it's because my hands are covered in blood. And I was like, this is great. One of my dearest friends, truly. Truly, I did not get axe murdered by this person. So um, anyway, I, uh, you know, when we talk about brain structure, I think it there was this idea still persisting, you know, when these studies were being done in the 80s and 90s that like 
the brain is like, you know, it's what makes us us. And it's like, it is what it is. And that's, that's what makes us us. But like, actually, our brains change so much during our lives. I mean, like, I have PTSD, it literally changed my brain. I mean, I don't have an MRI from before and after, but there's lots of research now on the fact that experiences and trauma, physical or emotional, like, makes your brain literally change and different parts of it get better or worse at talking to each other. And like physically, um, you know, structures can start to change. So there's also this really great point to make where it's like, even if Einstein's brain did turn out to be different from the average person's, like if we were able to study enough brains and his sample was in good enough shape, like it still wouldn't prove that's what made him so smart. It might be that the way he thought about things, the like intellectual exercises he engaged in and the way he lived his life, like made some funky stuff happen, which I think is such a cool way to flip things around. Um, And yeah, just to hammer home, like this is definitely uh, a a specimen of dubious ethics. He literally told the friend who was writing his biography, um, cremate me so that like no one comes to worship my bones because he thought it was so weird and messed up that people idolized him Um, wow and so when i think about people going to the mother museum and like gazing sarah i think it's a great comparison to like compare them to like catholic relics um (laughs) and I don't think it's like bad for people to do that, but it's it's food for thought that, um, you know, human remains uh, are are not neutral uh, historical specimens. And we really need to get better at talking about how we use them and like how we acquire them. Um, so yeah, I hope that over in Philadelphia, they, uh, they figure that out. I think they have a real opportunity to like be, uh, sort of, you know, best in class in terms of reckoning with that sort of thing. And, uh, if you're there and you see Einstein's brain, just, uh, take a moment to think about the fact that he wants you to leave him alone. (laughs) He wants to be in the Delaware River. (laughs) Leave Einstein alone. So that's my story. (laughs) Well, okay, we're going to take a quick break and uh, then we'll be back with one more fact. Okay, we're back. And um, Sarah, I don't even I don't even know where to begin. I don't know how to how to tears up. I just want to hear it. (laughs) I'll just jump right in. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this is something we can keep in here, but I'm going to drop it in anyway. And if you need to remove it for copyright reasons, that's totally fine. Um, before I start, I just want to note that when I first wrote the book of mine that um, caused Rachel to invite me onto the podcast, I had not yet read or heard of John Muellum's uh, atavist essay from 2013 um, titled American Hippopotamus. But I do want to say I visited his piece alongside my original source material to refresh myself on some of the finer details of what I'm about to share with you. And if you finish listening to this podcast and you want more granular detail, um, Mulalem's writing is really excellent on this subject. Okay, so I'm just going to set the scene for us real quick. Um, It's 1910 in the United States of America. The Oreo cookie and the zipper have not yet been invented, but they are on the horizon. (laughs) And we have we have two big problems, okay? Just two. Everything else is going <laughs> great. Problem number one is a meat shortage. The meat shortage um, in the United States at this time is a very real issue. We simply don't have enough grazing area for the animals that we consume as part of our common um, national diet. This is due to overgrazing, uh, one of the many agriculturally short-sighted issues that would eventually lead to the uh, ecological calamity known as the Dust Bowl. This meat shortage is a hot button issue. It is referred to as the meat question. And the question (laughs) is, how the hell are we going to feed everybody? Um, It's a question that fuels a lot of political campaigns of the day. You may have heard of the popular 1920s and 30s campaign slogan, a chicken in every pot which is attributed 
a lot of different places, but the kind of commonality of that rhetoric reflects how stressed people are about where they're going to uh, source meat for their diets. Also fueled a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric that has even leached into conversations we have in hindsight about the meat question today. Um, the question kind of got turned from how are we going to feed everybody to how are we going to feed those people who keep coming over here? Of course, blame the immigrants. Yeah, it's our national pastime. You know, it's like baseball, apple pie, uh, jingoistic rhetoric and (laughs) anti-immigrant. Gotta love America. Yeah, we're waving flags uh, over the (laughs) Zoom right now. (laughs) <laughs> so that's problem number one. And you may remember we had a second problem. And that problem was the invasive water hyacinth. The water hyacinth is a flower. It is very pretty and purple um, and extremely good at propagating. The This flower is actually known as the terror of Bengal for how invasive it is. Uh, water hyacinths grow, as you may have guessed from context clues, in the water. They float on the surface of the water and they grow these big, beautiful leaves and delicate, very pretty purple flowers. Um, They propagate both underwater via runners and over the water with seeds that can remain viable for up to 30 years in all kinds of adverse conditions. Water hyacinths double their size in about two weeks when they're growing. They can reproduce by a factor of 100 in under a month. I googled pictures and one of the ones that com- came up is uh, somewhere in India where like literally a whole body of water is just flower. They're very pretty, but seems like probably not what you want in your body of water. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's the cane toad of freshwater flora. Um, <laughs> and they grow in these big tangly patches. They like get their roots and runners kind of connected together and um, And when they grow in those big patches, they remove oxygen from the water. They prevent sunlight from reaching other plants that grow under the surface. They drop tons of dead plant matter to the floor of the waterway that they're on where it rots and produces ammonia and kills everything. They kill fish. um, They kill other plants. And mowing them down doesn't help because they reproduce under the water via runners. So it's kind of like if you grow mint in your garden and you try and trim it and it just sprouts back up everywhere, um, Mm -hmm. using oil or tarps to force them under the water to try and kind of drown them doesn't help because they produce bulbs beneath the water when they're submerged. And then those bulbs make more water hyacinth. Oh my God. I would I would suggest people who kill plants to like just adopt one of these and just like let them grow. They won't be they won't be feeling that frustrated about killing plants after it, but they might, you know, have a problem with their water and stuff, you know. Exactly. <laughs> it's a very popular freshwater backyard pond plant for this exact reason. Um so water hyacinths are not native to the US. They were brought to the US. Um at a New Orleans Centennial World's Fair, also called the Cotton Centennial in 1884, and distributed as gifts by the Japanese delegation to that fair. People loved them and started putting them in their yards and gardens, just like peacocks. To, you know, this is pretty, this is nice. And the hyacinths got into the Mississippi River. Oh, no. And the Mississippi oh. River is a pretty important one uh, in the United (laughs) States, especially at this time in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's a vital waterway for trade and tourism. Um, And the water hyacinths started choking off the Mississippi River and its deltas, growing so quickly and in such large amounts that boats could not get through and fish were dying in huge quantities. Um, It was a major ecological crisis. So these are the two problems facing the United States of America in 1910. And it's okay, because we have problem solvers ready in the wings to fix this issue. Frederick Russell Burnham had this idea, and it was an idea that he nurtured for a long time and told a lot of people about and worked really hard on. And his idea was to import hippopotamuses from Africa and set them loose in the swamplands of the Gulf Coast to raise them for food. 
oh no, oh no, as someone who knows the story Just of Paulo Escobar, <laughs> like, I know how this ends. This is not good. I'm glad you mentioned that. We will come back to him later. Um, <laughs> of course. Burnham was a gold rush guy. He was a miner who had a tendency to chase a profit. Um, he was kind of like a crypto bro of his day. He kept chasing quick get rich quick schemes. Um, not necessarily he had a Tesla. Yeah, definitely a Tesla <laughs> owner and a peacock complainer. Um, <laughs> maybe not a long term thinker. And he wanted to see America turn into a nation of hippo ranchers. Anyone who's involved in gold rushes would be very familiar with the dynamics of a land grab, which is also a great American tradition. We love saying, hey, this area that's inhabited by Native people is empty. Uh, white American citizens, go and grab some of it for yourself. And Burnham's idea was to take the so-called useless land of the uh, marshes and swamps on the Gulf Coast and turn them into useful land for ranching. This idea was not unpopular. He gave talks about it. Um, I, one assumes kind of anywhere he went that he could catch someone's ear. Like I'm picturing him sitting down next to me in a bar and I'm trying to read my book and have a little <laughs> glass of wine. And he's like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, and it really caught on. The paper of record advertised futures of lake pig or lake cow bacon. Um, and there were a lot of conversations oh, no. about how delicious this would be. Burnham was so into this idea that he and his pals managed to raise fifty thousand dollars which in today's money in 2023 translates to about 1.6 million to try and make this happen theodore roosevelt was kind of into it um of which, course he was yeah, yeah i was gonna say that absolutely <laughs> he just he wanted was. to like be riding a hippo into into battle yeah nobody loved killing animals as much as theodore roosevelt loves killing animals Absolutely and not. <laughs> his vision was kind of to turn, um, again, quote unquote, useless American uh, land preserves into game, big game hunting preserves where you could go and shoot a hippopotamus with your blunderbuss. Unfortunately, that didn't work out for a number of reasons. Um, but Burnham's dream didn't die because that's that's America, baby. You have a dream <laughs> and you can make it everyone's problem. Um he met a congressman, a congressman named Robert Broussard. Robert Broussard was a congressman from Louisiana. Uh, he was a real politician's politician. Like he was just, he was great at doing politics, which sometimes translates into great at representing uh, the people who are your constituents, and sometimes translates into great at making someone else's dream everyone's problem. Uh, and Broussard being from Louisiana, was very invested in the issue of water hyacinths in the river deltas. He, His constituents were making quite a lot of noise about how this was impacting their ability to live and, uh, and trade. And so Broussard heard this hippo idea and he thought, we can kill uh, two ecological issues with one gigantic animal. He introduced Bill... H.R. 23261 into Congress, also known as the Hippo Bill. It was a bill that would allow <laughs> for the importation of so-called useful animals from other countries, including hippos, camels, antelopes, giraffes, zebras. Oh, emos. they had a lot, uh, like an entire safari in their heads when they planned this, basically. Absolutely. I think this guy just saw every animal and went, I want to eat that. And, and he tried to make it happen <laughs> by law. Um, he introduced this bill and said, if we introduce these hippos into the waterways, the hippos will eat the water hyacinth. They will hoover up all these invasive plants and then we will eat the hippos and then everyone's problems are gone except one presumes the hippos who would have like <laughs> a significant problem introduced into their lives. <laughs> yes. Uh, they brought in so-called experts to testify about how smoothly this would all go, um, including a guy named Fritz Duquesne, who talked about how tame and meek hippos are. He, oh, no. oh boy. <laughs> You're in for how a surprise. How many hippos have he met? <laughs> he said that you can lead them around on leashes, that they are sweet and kind, that children <laughs> can adopt them as pets. Um, oh, no. no. 
<laughs> oh, no. He basically, if you've ever heard of the engineering concept of the um, hypothetical spherical cow, that's pretty much how he described hippos <laughs> to Congress. <laughs> so as my very astute uh, hosts have pointed out, that's not based in fact. Um, so here's some information about hippos for our listeners, if you don't already know. Uh, a hippo is a killing machine. Yes. <laughs> yes. They can weigh up to five tons, which is about the same weight as the ambulance you'll need to ride in if you ever meet one in the wild. Um, a hippo has tusks about the length of your forearm, um, sometimes longer. They can run up to 30 kilometers per hour over land. And the way they locomote in the water is not by swimming, it's by sprinting along the riverbed. I don't know about you, but I can't do either of those things. <laughs> they <laughs> no, cause, definitely not. They cause between 500 and 3,000 deaths per year, which is an especially high number when you consider where their populations are concentrated. Hippos are not concentrated in areas that are highly populated by human right, beings. Yeah. So, you know, when you consider like um, the, you know, the disparity between reporting on like uh, deaths caused by vending machines falling on people versus deaths caused by airplane crashes, you have to consider the context that fewer right. people are getting into airplanes than standing your vending machines. And when you consider how likely people are to come into contact with hippos, 500 to 3,000 deaths per year is... Yeah, it's a high mortality rate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> hippo encounter. Huge. It's basically, if you see a hippo, you'll die. Like Pretty much, yeah. Blank. I recently spoke to an Antarctic researcher who told me that if you see a polar bear and you're not within touching distance of very strong shelter, you should assume that you're already dead because the polar bear has been seeing you for long enough to decide that you are non-threatening enough for it to see you. Oh, hippos. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that that's a nice thought to have. Hippos are similar except there's no situation in which a hippo will think I shouldn't let that person see me <laughs> because they are not threatened by anything. Um <laughs> you may be wondering how do these hippos cause deaths if they're so sweet and docile are they just accidentally rolling over onto their friends during a snuggle party? No. Um hippos are not carnivorous. They are obligate herbivores, but they still eat meat even though it makes their bodies quite sick. There's, I have personally spoken to tons of researchers who have witnessed in the wild hippos just eating crocodiles. Oh my God. And you may wonder why. And the answer is because they like it, because they have formed a dark pact with some kind of nefarious demon to be the meanest animals on the planet. Um, they will chase you. Uh, if you this isn't a situation where you have to go and antagonize the hippo like a like a rattlesnake, they will chase you down um, in my work as a research assistant studying megafauna in 2016. I heard the story uh, from a man who was chased up a tree by a hippopotamus who then used its massive bulk to knock the tree down in order to get to him. I also spoke. With, I, I am speechless. <laughs> I also spoke with a uh, a guide who gives tours in Africa who said yeah I take people across this river and there's in one part of the river it kind of gets wide and there's hippos that hang out on one side and there's crocodiles that hang out on the other side and I always tell people if something happens to our boat and you end up in the water and you can't get back on the boat and you have to swim toward one of those shores swim toward the crocodiles because you are less likely to die oh my gosh <laughs> that, that is a lot so <laughs> that's some information about hippos uh, for you to think about when you're trying to fall asleep tonight. <laughs> now, here's other information about hippos that I said we would circle back to, and I did not lie. Uh, they, I'm just going to take us on a little detour to Colombia. Um, now, in Colombia, you may have heard of this small businessman and entrepreneur <laughs> named Pablo Escobar, who yeah. was interested in manufacturing and distribution of controversial substances. Um, he had a ton of money and he had a lot of property, including an estate in Hacienda Napoles that had a zoo on it full of exotic animals. It was about 250 kilometers northwest of Bogota. In 1993, the American DEA 
killed Pablo Escobar and then did what the U.S. government does best, which is to say did not make a plan at all for how to handle a situation responsibly. <laughs> not my hippos, not my problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we we just came to make a mess. Um, the DEA busted the compound and released a bunch of the zoo animals into the Colombian jungle, including the hippos, just assuming that they would die. Uh, some of these animals did get redistributed to zoos, but the ones that couldn't be placed or quote unquote couldn't be placed that people just didn't feel like dealing with uh, were assumed, you know, OK, they're not going to survive in this environment. But jokes on you because the hippos did not die. They instead have taken over the waterways of Colombia. <laughs> they started out as just a few hippos. As of early this year, when I last checked, their numbers had bloomed to around 150 throughout Colombia's largest river basin um, and had been sighted up to 400 kilometers away from Hacienda Napolis, where they kind of uh, first entered Started, the world. basically. <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of conversation about how to deal with these hippos. They are not, I would say they're probably less welcome than the peacocks in Florida at this point. Um, they fill the water with poop. They poop quite a lot and yeah. don't go places that they're not hanging out into poop. Like I leave my office chair and go to my bathroom. But right. if I was a hippo, I would just stay right here. Baby, keep on working. Um, <laughs> and their poop kills the fish uh, in the water. They also attack boats that are trying to pass through the, what they consider their territory, which can vary depending on what time of year it is and how horny they are. Um so they essentially choke off waterways for trade and tourism, uh, in short, causing all of the same problems as the invasive water hyacinth, but with a slightly higher mortality rate. Um, <laughs> <Just a> little. <laughs> I, I did promise. But like, there is some local pride about them too, right? Like, there, I've definitely seen like some people are like, but don't kill them. They're I mean, hippos. They are charismatic <laughs> megafauna, I think, until you get up close with them. And as yeah, such, fair I, enough. I feel I feel it's like a similar like case of like the Stockholm syndrome that the Floridians are having with the with the peacocks, I guess. Like, oh look, they're nice. They look sort of cute if you see them from afar. It's true. true. Probably how people feel about getting rid of the hippos is directly proportional to whether they have had a close encounter with a hippo. Absolutely, so. yes. <laughs> Um, and I did promise that this would include vasectomies. One proposed solution is uh, capture and sterilization of the hippos. Unfortunately, this is quite a bit harder to do than with neighborhood cats because <laughs> hippos are incredibly difficult to tranquilize. They're huge and difficult to transport. And there's not a huge knowledge base on performing hippo vasectomies. Um, so as of right now, People are kind of at a loss for what to do. So now you have all this context about hippos. And now you can recall that we had a congressional <laughs> bill proposing that we should do to the United States and the Mississippi River Deltas what the American DEA did to the major rivers in Colombia. Um, bring in hippos and try to ranch them, which, as we know from previous boom and bust land grab endeavors in the United States, doesn't end with a ton of super responsible ecological management. Uh, the end result would certainly be that our waterways would be populated by these hippos and the Mississippi River and, frankly, any connecting waterway uh, within 30 miles uh, over land would have hippopotami in it. Now, this bill was introduced. It was argued. People were very enthusiastic about it. Um, it did not, as you may have noticed, pass. Uh, oh, thank God. However, this bill <laughs> failed. Surprise. This, this bill failed in part uh, due to a lot of other things that were happening in the country at the time that sort of took people's attention and money, but also in part due to testimony from a couple of people who had been to Africa and seen how aggressive and hard to kill. I have, I have seen are. one hippo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I have been actually close to one, and it did not go well. Um, however, the bill only died by one vote. Oh my, oh god. my god! It came within <laughs> one vote of passing Congress and going to the U.S. Senate. Um, 
And so really makes you think about what could have been. If only somebody had written a book about that. If only somebody would write a pulp western about what could happen if that uh, bill had come to pass and a bunch of gay cowboys were tasked with fixing the problem. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, that's where we are today. Sadly, not being slaughtered by hippopotami every time we try to get from one side of the country to the other. Oh, Dang, now bummer. <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> It's so it's so crazy to think that there was like one vote away, like one yeah. vote, like had somebody like thought like, oh, my God, I might as well just go to the bathroom and they had missed the vote. <laughs> we might have been hippopotamus like all around us right now. Like that could be like a cause of death in the U.S., which is insane. One presumes that a time traveler from a different future we could have had managed to find their way back and clutch a congressman by the lapels <laughs> and say, don't do it. Don't do it. Vote no. Just hold your pee for a little while. Just vote and then you go. It's going to be fine. I kept thinking of um, when I was researching for my book, I read this very old medical paper on syphilis and it had this quote that is stuck with me. And I think of it all the time, which is syphilis is not a respecter of persons, which is a spin on um, one translation of a, a Bible verse that's like God is does not respect a individual person. It's like, you know, things things happen and it's not like God is smiting you. Anyway, I've always loved the phrase syphilis is not a respecter of persons and it pops in my head whenever uh, something is really not a respecter of a person. So I really just kept thinking, hippos are not a respecter of persons. <laughs> <laughs> Most they definitely. Really, are not. <laughs> really not, no. Absolutely not. Hippos, hippos do not respect the uh, sanctity or integrity of human life in any way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also love that you brought up uh, the Pablo hippo problem because I talked about that ages ago on Weirdest Thing and really focused on this one study about how like maybe there was a silver lining because maybe they were filling the ecological niche left behind by these like now extinct megafauna. And I've been thinking about doing a follow up to say like that it, that's off the table. There are too many hippos. <laughs> Turns out and too, too many hippos for that to even be a potential upside. So uh, yeah, back to back to the drawing board on uh, upsides for this this hippo issue. Um, wow. What a great mix of stories today. I love it. I mean, I had a great time. And I'm, <laughs> I just I keep thinking about the hippopotami. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about uh, those uh, murder pigs uh, that almost became American cuisine for for a long time. You know, if I may, um, if I may use the incredibly dense uh, neurons in one tiny corner of my brain, Please. That will be on a slide someday <laughs> real quick. I do think that we could solve the peacock problem by introducing hippos <laughs> into Florida's small towns. I mean, that would make a lot of sense. There's already like a lot of waterways. You know, the hippos would love it. And the Teslas, yeah. the Teslas would love it too. Teslas and yeah. hippos are natural allies. I think we should do it. The Absolutely. old lady who swallowed a fly, that is a, a tome of ecological brilliance. So Absolutely. That's, that's an how instructive text. All of our problems. <laughs> yeah. I, I sleep um, with it under my pillow. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, would you remind our listeners uh, what some of your books are called and where they can find you, including the hippo one? I think that would be a good one for people <laughs> to be able to find. <laughs> Uh, my hippo book is called American Hippo. It is a pulp western collection of two novellas and a couple of short stories about the uh, America that could have been had this bill passed. Um, I have also written The Echo Wife, Just Like Home, and Magic for Liars, which you can find anywhere books are sold. And I believe just as this is coming out, my uh, a collection of my original comic series with Liana Kangas titled Know Your Station about slaughtering billionaires on a space station will be released again everywhere books are sold um and you can find me you can find me on the non-dying social media platforms under my name sarah gailey and you can also find everything you could possibly want to know about my work at sarahgailey.com amazing the weirdest thing i learned this week is produced by all of our hosts including me rachel faltman along with jess Bodie, who also serves as our audio engineer and editor extraordinaire our theme music is by Billy Cadden. 
Our logo is by Katie Belloff. If you have questions, suggestions, or weird stories to share, tweet us at weirdest underscore thing. Thanks for listening, weirdos.